Hello everyone, Books with Banks back again after a brief hiatus there to fully enjoy my wedding and honeymoon, uh, but I'm back home now and eager to get back to talking about books. If I haven't already by the time this video is posted, uh, I'll likely be sharing a photo or two from the wedding and honeymoon, uh, probably just as something like community posts on here, uh, but one of the benefits of a honeymoon so far away in Africa, with so much time flying and traveling, is how much time I had to really focus in and try to finish up some reading. Uh, so even though it's taken a while, I'm happy to say that I finally finished reading Jani Wirtz's Fugitive Prince, book four in the overall Wars of Light and Shadow series, uh, but the first book in arc three of that series. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the series is divided into five arcs, with arc three, this one being the longest. Um, don't for a second take the several months it took me to read this as any kind of indication that I struggled with it or didn't enjoy it. Uh, I've simply had a lot going on, and it's not the easiest series to read and focus in on when you're distracted by a bunch of big life events. Uh, but now having finished the book, what did I think? Well, I absolutely loved it, and I can't wait to see where Words takes the series next. Uh, so what I'll do here is I'll try my best to give a brief uh, review, uh, spoiler free first, where I try not to spoil anything about the series, and I'll try to remain pretty vague. Uh, but then I'll dive into my more spoiler-filled thoughts in the second half of the video, and I'll clearly signal when I'm making that shift. Uh, without any further ado, let's get into it. So, Fugitive Prince was published in 1995. As I mentioned, this is book four of the larger Wars of Light and Shadow series, but book one of the third arc story uh, titled The Alliance of Light. So it's a continuation of a story I've already fallen in love with, but also the beginning of an exciting new phase of that story. And in this one, where it spends a lot of time setting up this third longest arc. Uh, there's a lot of fleshing out of some older side characters, introducing one or two intriguing new faces, and moving our players around the map. Characters also settle more and more into their convictions. A uh, really nasty and ugly side of the series' main conflict uh, comes out in the enslavement of enemies and the transition from a more fear-mongering propaganda scheme into this holy war facade. Uh, and throughout the whole book, our heroes are just trying to lay low, trying to save clans people from slavery, and running away from the terrifyingly powerful and self-righteous enemy for forces. Uh, and then, uh, throughout this story, more than any of the three before it, we get a series of different, I'd say, shorter episodes, uh, I think all of which highlight different angles of the beginning of this holy war. Um, for example, you have a minor character from before thrust into a sort of espionage story, easily one of my favorite parts and one of my, my favorite characters of the book. Uh, you also have a little bit about a princess being trapped in a tower. Uh, you have, as the title implies, a prince on the run and trying to avoid capture. Uh, and then you have what starts out as, in my opinion, uh, what was a smaller, less intriguing storyline that builds into the real focus towards the end. Uh, and one of my, uh, actually, probably my favorite part of the story, uh, that's the story of these two women at the top of their order of enchantresses and the games that they're playing to try and control the course of this holy war. What Wirtz does with these two women, one of them in particular, uh, I think that's the strongest aspect of this novel. Uh, also throughout the book, Wirtz continues to highlight the Fellowship of Sorcerers and their attempts to remain on the periphery of events, uh, even though they struggle to sit still uh, when they see so much violence and hate and ignorance and injustice. Uh, this book also has just a little bit more revealed about the ancient magical Peravian races, uh, but also other ancient creatures and the worlds that those creatures can dream up. Uh, and how dangerous it can be for humans to access those dream worlds. In short, uh, there's some mind-bending but beautifully depicted and incorporated magical and mystical elements. Any complaints I have about the book I think are probably pretty weak uh, because it's mostly all along the lines of I wish we saw more of so-and-so or there wasn't really any resolution to such-and-such. Such. Uh, but those aren't real critiques because this is just one small part of a larger series and I have every confidence in words uh, to deliver on those characters and storylines in future books. 
Uh, if I had to do a ranking of the series so far, um, before I move on to spoilers, real quick, last place, fourth place, I'm sorry, but I'll still probably say book one, Curse of the Mist Wraith. Uh, third place, I'd say I give to this one, Fugitive Prince. And second and first are so close, but second goes to book two, Ships of Marior, and first place goes to book three, Warhouse to Vastmark. All right. But now into spoilers, and thank you for watching if you've watched at this point, uh, but please turn away now if you don't want anything about the series spoiled. So, kind of the more specific overview, my reaction to this book. Lysair and Arathon are still cursed to hate each other. Arathon, through his training, is able to resist uh, more of the violent urges brought on by this curse, for the most part, uh, and so he's basically forced himself into exile with a small group of loyal friends and clan-born followers. Uh, they start off in these islands off the west coast of the main continent, and then to put even more distance between himself and his brother, Arathon sets off to explore other lands to find evidence of the disappeared and mysterious ancient Paravian races. Uh, while he's doing this, Lysair uh, starts enslaving clan peoples, and he also starts to build his army less on the fear of what his brother's evil shadow magic can do, and more now as a religious and righteous cause to rid the world of more sinful uh, and evil shadowy magics. Uh, Lysair is also unhappy with how much his wife uh, is actually bringing a more rational mind to the brotherly conflict. Lysair feels betrayed uh, by her simply because she has a much more um, realistic read on how crazy and probably magically influenced the rivalry actually is. So Lysair says, tells everyone publicly that she is having trouble bearing children uh, and that she's depressed about this, when in truth she'd be happy to try but he won't come near her. Um, he locks her high up in a tower, telling everyone else that she's hiding away um, by her own choice out of grief for not being able to have children. Uh, so yeah, uh, Lysair, I used to feel a little bad for him, how manipulated he was by the Mist Wraith, uh, and also for how he just doesn't have the ability to resist um, the Wraith's manipulations as much as his brother. Uh, but in this book, uh, really... Uh, this guy's doubling down on a lot of the worst possible aspects of his leadership style. Uh, starting this whole holy war and the alliance of light to go after his brother and starting to enslave people. He won't listen to reason. Uh, it seems at this point, at least, he's beyond saving. But, I should say, at the same time, I wouldn't put it past words to subvert even that kind of perception that I have. Uh, it also seems uh, like even though he lost his most loyal and cruel ally from the previous arc, it seems like Lysair surrounded himself with a pretty despicable council of new enablers, and I'm excited to see if words will flesh out any of these advisors in future books. Uh, luckily for our heroes, though, they have a spy in Lysair's court, uh, um, one man named Mirn Sabridian, uh, easily one of my new favorite characters. I always love uh, whenever a Mirn chapter would pop up in here. Um, he's basically pretending to be a partier, kind of a pompous ass, uh, but just all, like, he's doing all of that as a cover so that he can get as much info as possible to constantly be trying to disrupt Lysair's plans. Uh, Mirn was always a ton of fun, and I'm excited to see more of him, um, especially throughout this arc, this third arc of the series. As for other allies of Arathons, uh, we of course have our Fellowship of Seven, finding it increasingly difficult to not pick sides in the conflict, as Arathon is easily the more virtuous and respectable choice, at least at this point, and for the foreseeable future, and the different clans and their leaders um, these are also a um, bunch of uh, Arathon's allies, and uh, boy oh boy do they cross some great distances in this book just to relay information to stay as on top of things as possible uh, so that all the people resisting Lysair's uh, reign um, stand even a slim chance of escape and survival. Uh, Kaol? K Kaol? Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, he is one of the best side characters of the series, and this book is his best showing. It's it, He's one of my favorite parts here. Uh, this story is wonderful for him, uh, especially the role he plays in the last few hundred pages. Everything with him in the kind of back half here 
uh, is just so much fun to read. It's also pretty grim, uh, pretty intense, um, but I love how different people kind of find out about what he's up to and what he's managed to do. And they find out at different points in time, kind of. Um, so we get to see people go from real pessimistic to optimistic about chances. Uh, and after uh, Keale uh, turns things around in the favor of our heroes, of course, the ones who have to pay are Lysair and his soldiers, but more specifically, the Coriathane Order of Enchantresses. Lorenda, as first senior and the one set up to replace the leader of their order, Wurtz does so much with Lorenda in this book, uh, and Lorenda's ambition and pride and her kind of scheming mindset. Uh, but then also, Wurtz explores a lot of her terror of having her life threatened, and uh, terror at having her place in the order threatened. Uh, so yeah, while earlier in the book, everything with Mirren spying and Talith locked in the tower, all of that was my favorite part of this one, until... Kaali gets the upper hand, um, breaks free, uh, frees slaves, uh, and the slave or and uh, and soldiers, because the slaves are freed, the soldiers on their boats or Lysera's soldiers can arrive to cut off other clans people from escaping to the south. It's honestly such a joyful kind of turn uh, turnaround uh, and such a relief and where it builds to this uh, turning point so well uh, and you have Lorenda who is sent on this emotional roller coaster and Arathon shows kind of her this ultimate compassion and grace in returning this uh, the crystal to her and the song that he sings and how she struggles with the song uh, but even despite all that in the end she still managed to manages to get back in good with her order to have a pretty set plan um, on still how to go about defeating Arathon. I'm very excited to see uh, where that goes in in the next few books. Uh, so uh, on that note, uh, kind of thinking and being excited uh, for the next few books, I think I'll wrap up this overview slash review. It's really more just been me gushing over how much I like the book, uh, but I think uh, I'll, I'll end it there. If you've read this series and this one in particular, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, this book down below. Thank you everyone as always for watching. Have a great day.